Then Jeribel, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the spring of Herod. And the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. And anyone of whom I say to you, This one shall go with you, shall go with you. And anyone whom I say to you, This one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouths, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, With the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand. And let all the others go, every man to his home. So the people took provisions in their hands and their trumpets. And he sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, but retained the 300 men. And the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. That same night the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant. And you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outposts of the armed men who were in the camp. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts in abundance, and their camels were without number, as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance." When Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade. And he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned upside down so that the tent lay flat. And his comrade answered, This is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped. And he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. And he divided the 300 men into three companies and put trumpets into the hands of all of them and empty jars with torches inside the jars. And he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch when they had just set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hand the torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow. And they cried out, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Every man stood in his place around the camp and all the army ran. They cried out and fled. When they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. And the army fled as far as Beth Shitta towards Zerera, as far as the border of Abel, Mehola, by Tabith. And then, and the men of Israel were called out from Naphtali and from Asher and from Manasseh, and they pursued after Midian. Gideon sent messengers throughout 
the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and capture the waters against them, as far as Beth Barah, and also the Jordan. So all the men of Ephraim were called out, and they captured the waters as far as Beth Barah, and also the Jordan. And they captured the two princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they killed at the winepress of Zeb. Then they pursued Midian, and they brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon across the Jordan. Thanks, Philippa. And uh, let me add my welcome to Sinan. It's great to be here and with you. Right, keep that passage open. Um, the text won't be on the screen, so um, it will be really good to have either on your phone or in the Bible. There are a few Bibles sort of lurking around, so do grab one. Um, it would be really helpful. We're actually looking at chapter 6 and chapter 7, so the good news is we're not going to be any longer than usual. Uh, but, um, yeah, we're going we're to tackle a fair chunk. Let's pray. Let's ask God to help us. Father God, we thank you so much for your kindness to us in being a speaking God. We thank you so much that even um, in parts of the Bible that seem remote and difficult to understand, the glory and truth of your gospel is right there. And I pray, Father, that you would help us see it this morning and see why, uh, why we should believe it and, and how to change because of it. For the glory of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Um, it seems to me the world doesn't have time for weakness. Uh, the world values strength and power uh, across all cultures. So uh, physical strength and fitness is valued, isn't it? So that, you know, the guy, that guy can lift two cars at CrossFit. You know, he's like a, a machine. Um, or there's personal strength is also valued. Discipline and self-control. Intellectual strength is valued, so you, someone who can grasp ideas quickly and, and kind of think clearly. Leadership strength, so getting others to do stuff for you. All of that is valued uh, in, in the world, strength and power. Weakness is, you know, it's weak, isn't it? But while the world values strength and power, the reality is we're all weak in some way. So physically... However fit and machine-like your body may be, it is fading out. I'm reminded of that three times a week uh, when I go running on the beachfront. A whole five kilometers, and my body is fading out. I know that. Personally, we're weak. We don't have the power of self-control that we wish we had. Right? We eat stuff that we told ourselves we wouldn't eat. Um, our character isn't what we, what we want it to be. Intellectually, we're weak. Um, we can't do certain things. Grade 7 maths, in my case. I can't help my kids with any of that. Now, of course, Christians can add to that spiritual weakness. So as Paul says in Romans 7, I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Man, I just can't seem to beat my sin. And perhaps circumstances are making it really hard to trust Jesus, right? Feeling like you've got really weak faith. At the moment, I don't pray enough. I don't talk about Jesus enough. When it comes to Christianity, you know, I'm definitely more Clark Kent than, than Superman. Now, what do you do with your weakness? Well, the world might say, fight it, ignore it, uh, deny it, uh, run from it, or uh, sort of reach inside yourself for inner strength to beat it. The Christian is someone who does the opposite actually not just acknowledges their weakness, but um, embraces it or is comfortable in it and then looks outside themselves for strength. So, so what we're going to see today is plenty of weakness. Israel is a weak people. Gideon is a weak savior with a weak army. But we're going to see immense strength and power from outside of them to bring them to victory. So remember where we are in the book of Judges. God has given his people the land. Um, they haven't cut out the cancer, uh, got rid of the Canaanites as he asked them to. So they got stuck, haven't they, in this cycle of sin and, uh, and idolatry, which then leads to oppression, which then leads to them crying out before God, which then leads to God in his grace and mercy raising up a judge or a savior to rescue them from that, which is great. It brings peace until... 
that judge dies, and then the cycle continues back to sin and idolatry and stuff. And as, as you may remember, we said it was a downward spiral as we go through the book of Judges. The oppression gets longer. The rescuer becomes more unhinged. Uh, and the period of peace gets shorter. It's a downward spiral, and we're heading further down that today. So the first thing we're going to see this morning is a weak people. A weak people. So just look with me at chapter 6, verse 1. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Okay, we're getting very used to that phrase, aren't we? The people of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. Verse 2, and the hand of Midian overpowered Israel, and because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites, the people of the east, would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel, no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock, their tents. They would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted so that they laid waste the land they, as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian and the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. So do you see what's happening here? Israel have worshipped the other gods around them. God has given them over to the Mid Midianites who are basically, they're like the ancient equivalents of the playground bullies. And they, they come in to steal their lunch, so to speak. Uh, they didn't come to occupy the land, they came to plunder the land. So if you're an Israelite, you would plant your crops, rear your livestock, but every year it was the same. The Midianites would swoop in at the time of harvest in their thousands. I sort of imagine them riding Harley Davidsons as they sort of come into town. And you as an Israelite would escape to the mountains and they would just take everything and there's nothing left. I mean, you know, talk about weak. Seven years in a row this happened and there was nothing you could do. So from the caves, in the mountains, hiding, they cry out to the Lord for help. Verse 7. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. Now that is odd, isn't it? Do you see that? Surely that should read, when they cried out to God, he sent them a savior or a deliverer or a judge. Why a prophet? You know, isn't that a bit, it's a bit like breaking down on the M4 and someone coming out to read poetry to you. It's, it's nice, but it's not what you need, right? Israel needed rescuing. True, but here's the thing. What they needed more than rescuing is to know why they needed rescuing. They needed to understand why they're in that situation of being oppressed by Midian in the first place. So often what a parent will ask a child, right, is you put them in time out, do you know why you're there? Think about what you've done. So they stopped doing it. Same for Israel. They need to see the evil of their sin themselves, so they stopped doing it. So he sends them a prophet who says, verse 7, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt, brought you out of the house of slavery. I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians, from the hand of all who oppressed you. I drove them out before you, gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods... You shall not worship, in other words, the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. He's saying, I've shown you nothing but grace and kindness. I've brought you out of Egypt, out of slavery. I've rescued you. I've delivered you. I've given you their land so that we can live together. I even warned you about worshiping other gods, but you haven't listened to me. And that's why you're in this situation. Not because that's how life goes or because the Midianites are just bigger and nastier. It's because you haven't listened to me. And I want you to know that because I want you back. I want true repentance, not just, ah, oh, life is hard repentance. True repentance. Sit and think about why you're here, says God. So he sends a prophet. Isn't that kind? So Israel are weak spiritually, which means they're weak politically. They're being bullied. Now, of course, outside of Christ, I'm also weak uh, like them, I would, be, I would not be able to help myself. I would ignore God. I would go after other gods. And, and even in Christ, I'm tempted to do that, to go after other gods of money, of lifestyle, of career, whatever it may be, family. I'm just as weak. But I want you to notice how God responds to their weakness. 
uh, in his people. See in verse, uh, verse 10 and 11. It, right In between verse 10 and 11, you might expect another verse. So look at verse 10. I am the Lord your God who shall not, you shall not fear or worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. What do you expect next? Therefore, I will punish you. Therefore, judgment. That's what's come every other time. But instead of that, verse 11, now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah. Isn't that great? So even in their mess and sin, God came to them, not in judgment, but in grace and kindness and patience, as we'll see. So we've seen the weak people. Now we meet the weak savior. Secondly, a weak savior. Verse 11, now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth of Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abia's right, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. So like everyone else, he's basically in hiding. Not a great start for God's leader. Verse 12, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Now this touches a nerve with Gideon. Verse 13, Gideon said to him, please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. So Gideon didn't think the Lord was with them. How could he be? Look at what's happening. Every year we have to run for the hills while these guys come and take our our lunch. He's, He's clearly abandoned us. So what's he doing? He's doing what we often do, isn't he? He's looking at his circumstances. He's seeing his circumstances are suboptimal to say the least and he's saying well that that must mean that God has abandoned us that must mean that God is not with us instead of seeing actually God is in control of everything and he might be using this very situation for our good verse 14 and the Lord turned to him and said go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian do not I send you and he said to him please Lord how can I save Israel Bel, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. He's saying, I'm weak. I'm the weakest person in Israel. You've got the wrong guy. Now, if you, think about it. If you wanted someone to sort of raise up and lead Israel into victory, um, what would be at the top of your list of qualities? Probably these two things, faith and courage. And Gideon seems to have neither. So think about, faith, uh, think about courage. He's in hiding. He's not just from a weak clan, but the weakest in his family, he says. In terms of faith, he thinks God's abandoned them, and he's more than likely been worshipping Baal instead of Yahweh anyway. So he's far from ideal as a leader of Israel. But as the chapter goes on, you will see him slowly growing in faith and courage. So, and, and the reason you see him growing in faith and courage is because of the, God, the way God treats him in kindness and patience. So, so he's standing there, he's threshing his wheat in the wine press to keep, you know, to keep them from Midian. And, and, and the man, it, it becomes clear to him that the man he's talking to is a messenger from the Lord. Capital letters, Yahweh. And again, his lack of faith makes him unsure about this, so he asks for a sign, verse 17. And he said to him, if now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Please do not depart here from here until I come to you and bring out my present uh, and, and set it before you. And uh, as he said, I will return. Um, sorry, he says, I will stay until you return. So he doesn't say, the, the messenger doesn't say, look, where's your faith? Of course it's me. He says, okay, I'll wait. It's like he's saying, I will wait for you, Gideon, to be the man I need you to be in order to accomplish what I need to accomplish. Gideon goes off, he prepares an offering, he lays it before the angel on the rock. The angel touches it, fire consumes it, boom. At the same time, the angel of the Lord disappears, and it's then that Gideon realized, actually, this is not an angel. I've been speaking to the Lord face to face, and therefore I must, I must face death. That's what happens. But the Lord, still speaking to him, verse 23, says, But peace be to you, do not fear, you shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord, and called it the Lord is peace. To this day, it still stands at, at Orphra, which belongs to the Abbey Israelites. Now, we've got a problem here. Haven't we? Could you, did you see that? So there's an altar to God, but there's altar, also an altar to Baal next to the altar to God, the, the altar that 
Gideon's father had built. So you, can, you see the visual, right? There's an altar to God and there's an altar to Baal. That can't be allowed to continue. Surely God won't let that continue. Verse 25. That night the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull, the second bull, seven years old, pull down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on the top of the stronghold here with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull, offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah, nice touch, uh, that, you can, that you cut down. Again, God's saying, you've got to cut out the cancer. There's one God in this place, and it's not Baal. Get rid of it. So verse 27, Gideon took 10 men of his servants, did as the Lord had told him, uh, which is good, right? But look, because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. So there's encouraging signs, but we've still got a guy who's afraid of his family and, and community, and that's kind of highlighted in the morning. So the town wakes up, they see that the altar to Baal is gone, and, and uh, they catch wind it was Gideon, so they go to his house, and because he must die, right, because he's deeply offended Baal, um, and, and actually you sort of think, well, actually this is a great opportunity for that moment in the movies, isn't it, where the, the true leader comes out to his people and he gives that speech, um, you know, now is the time, people of Israel, to stop worshipping the people of Baal and worship the true God. And everyone cheers, and yeah. Except it's not even Gideon who comes out, it's his dad. Uh, it's his dad who comes out. And um, he basically floors him with the logic. He says, well, look, it's not ideal, but uh, if Baal really is God, he should be able to zap Gideon on his own, and let's leave it between Baal and Gideon situation diffused. But again, we're not super encouraged uh, by, by Gideon's leadership qualities. And to make matters worse, it's that time of year again. Harvest has come. Israel um, has got food again, so the bullies are back. And it's the same old story. Here they come, run for the hills. But there's a twist. Not this time. Verse 34. The Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon and he sounded the trumpet, and the Beezrites were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, and they too were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they went up to meet him. The Spirit of the Lord clothed him. See that? Like a huge cloak of power and strength, absorbing his lack of faith and courage. He sees the same old story unfolding. He says, no, 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 not this time. He blows the trumpet, sends out the messengers, this time... The Lord does it differently. The Lord is with us. Which is something the Lord said to him in verse 16. Did you see that? See verse 16? Gideon is like, look, I'm, you know, weaky McWeakness. Um, but God says, I will be with you. Now Gideon has everything he needs in that statement. I will be with you. He can go through a lot. He can achieve a lot. He can defeat a lot of armies with that promise. I will be with you. Notice that God doesn't follow up with, and here's exactly how it's going to plan out. Um, you're going to do this, this, or this, and this. It's just the who. We often want that, don't we? We want the what and the why and the how, but we forget to think about the who. Who is it that is in charge? It's the old phrase, isn't it? I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. We always want the what, when, and the how, but the who is the most important thing. I will be with you. Actually, what we need in our weakness is a bigger view of the who that is with us. And that's essentially what Gideon asks for here. He's been cloaked with the Spirit of God. He's blown his trumpet. The armies have assembled, but still Gideon needs encouragement and assurance. Verse 36. Then Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand as you've said, behold, I'm laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there's dew on the fleece alone and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand as you've said. And it was so. When he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. He does the same the next day, if you know the story, just reversed, and the fleece is dry. Now, this, this passage often, I don't know if you've heard this, is often used about, you know, making decisions in life. I, I'm going to put out a fleece. And by that often we mean, Lord, if you want me to take this job, 
let me get a phone call at 11.15 today. You know, that, that sort of approach. Well, that's not what's happening here. Gideon knows exactly what needs to happen. He's asking God to build his faith. He wants, God, he wants to know that God is not one of the forces of nature, gods that is around them, but this is the God over all of nature. Remember, he didn't have a Bible to look at. He needs to know. He's asking for a bigger picture of God. Show me who you are so that I know you are going to do what you said you were going to do, that you're going to save Israel by my hand, like you said. I need a bigger picture of you. And, and let me say, if we're going to trust God in our lives now and for our futures, we're also going to need a bigger view of that God so that we know who it is who holds the future. All right, what have we seen? We've seen a weak savior. He's from the weakest clan, weak family, youngest, unsure that God's there, busy worshiping another God, in fact. We've seen um, uh, not exactly hero status, right? So, so it's, a weak, it's a weak savior. What I want us to see is that at every point where Gideon is struggling with doubt and fear, God meets him with kindness and patience. Have you seen that? I will be with you. Do not be afraid. The sign of the offering with the angel, right? The fleece. God is building him up slowly and slowly until he clothes him with his spirit. You know, whenever I um, did DIY at home, uh, which is not, which is less than frequent and less than successful usually, um, but when Reese was young, he always wanted to help me. You know, when he was like one or two. It's probably a boy thing. He just, want, he just wanted to hit stuff with a hammer, basically. And, but, but he was too weak, right, to do it by himself. Um, so I couldn't let him do it by himself. But what I did do, obviously, put the hammer in his hand, put my hand around his, and then we, and then we hammer together. Is he hammering? Yes, but in my strength and direction. That's what's happening here. Gideon is weak on his own. But, of course, he's not on his own. He's in the hands of a patient and kind and loving and powerful God. And I do want to say, remember that next time you're tempted to think, God could never use me for anything. Or there's no way I could serve in the kids' church or do anything in, in church. I'm not, I'm not good enough. I'm not bright enough. I'm not whatever enough. Well, you are because you're in the hands of a powerful, awesome God who uses everyone, weak people. So a weak people, a weak savior, lastly and briefly, a weakened army. Notice the necessity of their weakness. Very important point. Verse 1, chapter 7. Jeroboam, that is Gideon, all the people who were with him rose early and camped beside the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me and say, my own hand has saved me. Now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. So, so Gideon's done the fleece thing. He's brimming with newfound confidence. The armies are assembled. God drops the bombshell. You have too many men in your army. I'm sure Gideon's like, look, I know I'm new to this army thing, but surely you can't have too many men, right? Isn't that a good thing? Sure, says God, if the end goal is winning the battle. But the end goal actually is not winning the battle. The end goal is for Israel to know for sure that God, it is God who has rescued them. And, if, and for them to give him glory and honor. God says it's too risky with so many men. There's a risk that they'll win the battle and think it was them. Well, how will God make sure they don't fall into the, to the trap? Easy. Drop their numbers by two-thirds. So the sergeant major gets everyone lined up. Okay, everyone, tension, whatever. If you're feeling scared and you don't want to be here, you can go home. 22,000 turn around and walk off. How does that, I mean, talk about morale in the army, right? Still, okay, okay. 10,000 is a good army. That's solid. Too solid, according to God. Verse 4. The Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Take them down to the water, I will test them for you there, and anyone of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, shall go with you, anyone of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he wants to thin out the army even more, God, so he comes up with a drinking test, uh, and the test was who would, um, 
<coughs> who would scoop up water like, and drink like a dog like this, um, or who would get down on their knees and drink. The result of the test, you've got 300 lappers, and you've got uh, 9,700 kneelers, and God says, with the 300, I will save you. Now, I don't know if you did this at Sunday school. I did this at Sunday school. And I was always told, you know, the guys who stood up and drink were like vigilant, you know. That those are the people you want in your army. And they're, they're standing. The, only, the others only just thought of their thirst and, and got down there. So God's chosen an elite force. The problem with that is, of course, that that's not in the text. And in fact, the more you say this 300 is an, is an elite kind of Sparta 300 force, the further you get from the point of the text that, that actually is God doing it. So Gideon started the day with 32,000 men, ended it with 300. That is a reduction of over 99%. But God wants them reduced to helplessness. So when they win, they have to say it was God who did it for them. So the 300 are poised. They're ready to go. We're ready for the battle. It's been a long time coming. But there's a pause in the story. Again, the patient and kind God goes out of his way to reassure Gideon. So secondly, you get encouragement in their weakness. Verse 8. <clears throat> so the people took provision in their hands, their trumpets. He sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, but retained the 300 men. And the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. That same night, the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. So they go down to the camp, which is huge, we're told, swarm of locusts. They sneak into the camp, and just at the right time, they overhear two people talking. One soldier is telling another how he had a dream that a loaf of bread came rolling down the hill into the camp. Uh, remember, by the way, what Gideon was doing when we met him, threshing wheat in the wine press, uh, and it destroyed the whole palace, the whole place, sorry. And, and the other guys say, yeah, 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 that's Gideon. So Gideon overhears this. He's overwhelmed with this, and we're told he bows down and worships at that moment. Goes back to camp, pulls everyone together, and says, we are going in tonight under the cover of darkness, and the Lord has given us victory. Now, just pause for a second, right? See how Gideon's changed. When we met him, he was hiding with fear in the wine press. Now, he is worshiping God and calling his, his people to battle. Notice again, though, the kindness of God. He doesn't just make the promise of salvation to Gideon. He wants Gideon to know that he will be saved. And it, listen, it's the same for us. It's an amazing truth. God doesn't just want you to be saved. He wants you to live a life knowing that you are saved. It is a wonderful kindness. Like a good husband wants his wife to know that he, he loves her. He doesn't just say, well, I said I love you on our wedding day. You know, there's a ring and everything. He says, no, I want you to know that I love you. He assures us. Same with God. He wants you to know that you're saved. He pours his spirit into us for that very reason. The third last thing we see, power in their weakness power in their weakness. So they're lined up, 300 of them against tens of thousands. There's no mention of weapons. They've each got a torch, a jar, and a trumpet. They're spread out across the hillside. Wait, they wait for the change of God, and then they blow their trumpet uh, as loud as they can. They break the jars so the torches can be seen, and they shout, a sword for the Lord and a sword for Gideon. And then there's chaos in the camp, right? The 300 are given the impression, I think, <clears throat> through their torches, that they are far more numerous. They've taken advantage of that moment with the change in guard, presumably because when those who are asleep wake up, they see armed people in their guard, in the darkness, in their camp in the darkness, and then they, it, chaos ensues. We're told, actually, the Lord caused them to turn on each other. In fact, listen, when it comes to killing Midianites... There is no record of the 300 doing anything except blowing horns and shouting. You know, in uh, Reese's rugby team, uh, when he was growing up, I think he was under 11 at the time, he had a, um, a, a winger in his team whose uncle was the beast, uh, Tendai and uh, Now imagine the beast came onto the under 11 game and, you know, scored a few tries, basically won the game for them. It would be unlikely for the rest of the team to walk off the pitch going, thank you, thank you, we've done it, yeah, thank you. They would be like, 
I don't know, I didn't really do anything. He did it all. And I sort of imagine the soldiers walking off this battlefield in a similar frame of mind. I don't know, I just turned up, I blew my trumpet, smashed the thing, and I don't know, God did it all. You know, easiest battle ever. Now again, listen, if we're Christians... And even if we're not here this morning, this is the very place we need to get to. I am weak. There's no way I can beat my sin. There's no way I can beat death. None of us in this room, everyone in this room, unless Jesus returns first, will face death. None of us can beat that. And the message of Christianity is, you don't have to. God has fought and won for you. He sent a savior for us too. Like Gideon, he appeared beaten and weak and defeated. He could not have appeared more weak as he he hung on a cross, tortured by, by the Romans. He appeared weak and beaten, but actually, as he died on the cross, he was achieving the greatest victory of all time. It was God fighting and beating sin and death for you. And for me, if you're a Christian, what have you done? Nothing. I just watched and I trusted. And then what did God do? He clothed us with his spirit so that we can get out of that cycle of sin and idolatry. Not perfectly, but we can now worship the true God. You know, it can be really easy to lose sight of your own weakness. Your, your weakness can be eclipsed by your ability in other areas of life. You might be really good in business. You might have been successful. You might have done this, or that, or the other, run a good family. That can sometimes lead you to think, I'm not weak because, look, I'm good at that. Maybe you've had some success with sin. I'm not doing that anymore. That's great. That can eclipse our weakness. Maybe Christian habits, church, Bible, prayer, whatever it is. We need to acknowledge our weakness. We need to embrace it and then clothe ourselves in God's strength. Remember the hand and the hammer. Because as Paul says, his power is made perfect in weakness. That, that, is, when God's, that is when God's power is most clearly seen. In saving us, if we're not Christians. In growing us, if we are Christians. Just listen to these words. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9. My grace is sufficient for you, says God, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul says, therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecution, calamities. Listen, for when I am weak, then I am strong. It is when I am at my weakest that God proves his strength. So I boast in that weakness, says Paul. I I embrace it. I'm comfortable in it. What have we seen? A weak people, God responds with grace. He comes to them. A weak savior, God responds with patience and kindness. We've seen a weak army. God responds with power and victory. Let's embrace our weakness and then be clothed in his strength because his power is made perfect in our weakness. Maybe you don't need to be told that you're weak. Maybe you just know this all too well. Well, embrace his strength. Okay, you need to know God has done everything for you. He's given you a savior. He's won the battle for you. He's given you his spirit to live in you so that you can live to please him. And and you need to know he is patient and kind and full of grace. So embrace his strength. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for what we see here in this, in this passage. Uh, and we thank you for your patience and kindness with Gideon, a weak person who, is, who, is, who has the job of leading your people into victory. Father, I thank you that when we acknowledge our weakness, when we see it and we recognize it, we live, we live it. Father, we can turn to you for strength. We can turn to you for grace. And you welcome us. 
uh, because you are a God whose, whose power is made perfect, is seen most clearly in his people's weakness, because then all glory and honor goes to you. We thank you for that, and we thank you for Jesus. Amen.